Well, I just want to welcome everybody here today for this panel. And we calling it a webinar, but really a panel of guys uh, that uh, really have a heart to equip the church. And so we've asked uh, for these guys to be on this panel to discuss kind of this unprecedented reality that the church and the world that the church is in is, is is a part of. And so this is there's no there's no manual, there's no rule book, there's nothing. Um, that says this is the ABC of how we're going to go and weather through this. And so we want to be able to uh, drop in some of the things and the questions you guys have been laying out uh, inside of just being able to tackle some of these topics. So I want to take a few minutes for every person on this call to introduce themselves. Uh, and you'll see already um, some of the, the, the links that you can go to. And we wanted them to do this because as you're hearing them talk, you can be going to their resourcing and getting more equipping as the church. So I'm going to go real quick first. Um, my name is Drake Farmer. I'm an executive pastor in a church up in uh, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Um, and so uh, we're, we're a larger church. And so as we look at even weathering through this, uh, we know that we're going to be one of the last that's going to be able to do gathering and mass gatherings. Um, and I'm also uh, moderate with the weekend worship and guest services uh, Facebook group um, and also do some leadership training. Uh, Jeff, why don't you go next? Awesome. So I am about as far away from you as physically possible. Uh, my, my name is Jeff Reed. Uh, I live with my family down here in Miami, Florida. Uh, I've had a long run of working with churches, production, communications, creative, um, digital pastor, online pastor, currently stepped out of that. I run a, a company called The Church Digital, where we create resources helping churches try to figure out how to do church online, blogging, podcasting, webinars, fun stuff like that. I also operate as the director of digital church planting for Stadia Church Planting, an organization they planted a thousand churches around the world. And um, pre-COVID, even they were tracking with this idea of starting to plant digital churches, which was really controversial until like COVID came, and now every church in America is a digital church or non-existent. So it's been a really fascinating conversation here, mm -hmm. trying to reimagine and then see it happen in real life what a digital church, a digital only church, would look like. Ryan, why don't you go next? Yeah, I'm Ryan Wakefield here in Kansas City, Missouri, the Missouri side of part of Summit Park Church. Uh, so I also run an organization called Church Marketing University, where we help uh, churches get more visitors every single week. So that's what we focus uh, day in, day out on. Uh, and so, yeah, excited to be a part of this. It's going to be awesome. Myron. What's happening, y'all? Myron Pierce, uh, inner city Omaha, Nebraska, leader inner city church um have a network of churches that, that we've planted over the years and uh like jeff we've actually uh more than a year have been experimenting with digi churches and over the last month have planted eight digi churches um i also run a digital marketing agency working with churches and different type of organizations uh to kind of help them uh manage the whole digital online experience so fun so excited to be a be a part of what's happening today greg yeah my my title is uh central director of assimilation and guest services so i'm in charge of the star trek campus i guess at my church but <laughs> it's it's basically means that my ministry is helping uh new people get meaningfully connected with god in our community on the front end and uh, uh my church is gene apples church we're in anaheim california we're multi-site. And then my side gig is called Climbing the Assimilayas. And I work with other churches, both large, medium size, and small, in developing their assimilation strategy uh, that's custom for them uh, to connect people well and, and automatically. Uh, and uh, it also um, is something that, uh, uh, that, I, that I do for like video courses and that kind of stuff. So the URL that's on my my uh, face leads you to those resources, including the ones for online adaptations. Sean. Hey guys, honored to be with you. I'm Sean Lovejoy, uh, founder and CEO of CourageToLead.com. I was a church planter turned mega church pastor, turned pastor coach. We now work with ministry and marketplace leaders. We talk about helping leaders and their teams grow healthier and, and grow faster. And uh, I'm, our headquarters is Birmingham, Alabama, as you can tell by my accent. And we're honored to be with you guys today. Awesome. And Greg, why don't you round us off? Yeah, uh, I'm Greg Atkinson. Uh, I was at uh, a conference at Sean's Church uh, in Georgia uh, before you were in Birmingham. And um, you guys are doing some killer stuff. I remember blogging about 
the way you had your auditorium set up and the bistro tables and uh, just creative use of space. But um, my, my, my passion is resourcing and equipping church leaders. And so uh, we wanted to bring this webinar to, um, to my Facebook group and other Facebook groups eventually, uh, because these are guys who are in the trenches that I greatly respect. Um, I've known Jeff for a long time. Uh, I have great respect for Ryan and what he's doing. Greg Curtis spoke at our first impressions conference. I'm keeping an eye on him and watching his Facebook lives when he goes live. And I've been to Myron's church and uh, he's doing some killer stuff in Omaha. And so i um, just so excited to have these guys here be a part of this. And uh, I'm just going to kind of sit back and take it in and be a fly on the wall because there's a lot of wisdom in this group. Uh, I coach pastors and church leaders and consult with churches. Um, known for doing secret shoppers, but also do a lot of Zoom coaching just like this. So glad to be a part. Awesome. So let's just jump right in. One of the things that we really want to tackle is some of the things that we've been, uh, a lot of people are asking questions about uh, in the group that myself and Greg moderate is this idea of assimilation or that the three terms I've been using is interaction, in, um, sorry, interaction, self-identification, and engagement. So um, for a lot of churches, they're still going to be doing this digital church 100% for a while. Um, some of them are going to be even transitioning out of that, but this whole new reality is still there. And so what I want to say is how do we, how do, we do this idea of interaction? I want to I define those three things really quick. Interaction, self-identification, and engagement inside of this new reality. Because even with us moving back to, um, to, to, to physical spaces, whatever that is and whatever context people are in, People have been tuning in in an unprecedented way into church services that, that would have never set foot in church. So even if you're starting to meet again, those people aren't automatically going to be starting to interact with you in a physical space, but they have this new way to be able to interact. And so when, when, when I talk about interaction, self-identification, engagement, what I mean is this, is when they are interacting with you, if that be digital, if that be on social media or whatever that is, even before they step foot in your church, what ways can we um, help people interact in, in better ways that is engaging. The second thing is that even especially in a digital sense, uh, I know that a lot of churches moving the, the way that we've done connect cards and systems now in this digital world is not working. Um, I know that Greg did a, a few webinars where, you know, looking at the drop of connect cards and we're having to think how do we get people to self-identify in this reality in a whole new way. What we did before is probably not going to work as we move forward. And the last thing is, as they self-identify, how are we helping them engage into Christ-like discipleship relationships? What's that pathway look like? So I know that's a big topic, um, and I, I want to throw first and foremost to you, Greg, if you want to take one of those um, and just kind of ideate a little bit about some ideas that you've been seeing, um, and then other people can chime in on different things of, of what ways, in innovative ways or new ways, or things that you're seeing churches doing that is actually getting traction in this. Was that Greg Curtis or Greg Atkinson? Oh yeah, Greg Curtis, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one of the big shifts we've seen in that area is uh, going from a digital gift, like what we started with was an Amazon gift card, you know, like a $5 Amazon gift card, and seeing marginal results, you know, less than what we saw when we were gathering physically, but you know, we'd maybe get 40. Um, but uh, we, we've been seeing kind of an uptick in, a less costly version of that in giving away free digital assets that are meaningful to them. Uh, like one of the things that we're doing now is uh, we're doing the, uh, uh, our own version of a 21 days of prayer, which includes a daily video from our pastor about four minutes long. And then some materials that uh, uh, myself and my team have put together uh, for prayer prompts. And that's the big blast to everybody. And it's talked about in the sermon. It sounds really cool. So if you'd like to get those resources, uh, you know, sign up here, but it's for everybody. And so kind of this, everybody's getting this thing. I mean, we, we may have had a thousand people sign up last weekend for that. And then on the back end, we, we figure out is uh, who's new that we never had profiles for, and those are our guest leads. So that's been a way we've gone from paid to free giveaway. And then we've gone from just new guests here to everybody. We're doing this great big thing and we're collecting ways to be a part of it. And so we get, this, this massive pile of, of signups and on the back end we identify which ones are new that we've never heard from before or had record of and then we put them into kind of a, I guess a funnel of communication 
And that funnel, uh, it like for instance, now that we're in the 21 days of prayer, that funnel is driving them to our first next steps online, which is rolling out on May, in, in May. And so that's where we're driving all of those people to, to find connections both in, in service and in, in online small groups uh, for the now. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to chime in? Yeah, one of the things that, that as, as you, Drake, talked about interaction, self-identification and engagement, one of the things we've, we've done is create what I'm, what I'm calling a digi church funnel. And basically it's social media marketing. So we're launching a new digi church in Accra, Ghana this Sunday. And one of the things we're doing for interaction is I'm blasting what I call a testimony ad. And as I blast this testimony ad to Accra, the next step is what uh, the dude out of Guts Church would call a, call a ministry ad. And I'm simply asking, hey, how can I pray for you? Mm -hmm. And then the last, the last at the bottom of the funnel is a, is a plan your visit ad. And so I'm retargeting every single time I get to the, you know, get down to the core of, of them joining us in our, in our digital auditorium. So that's been very fruitful for us. We're seeing tons and tons of people convert um, at each level um, to the place where we can ultimately get them into a disciple making relationship. Drake, I'll just say I'm, I'm, I'm really glad the conversation is shifting from assimilation to engagement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I tell leaders all the time, like one of the biggest lies from hell I ever believed. I think Larry Osborne first told me this that if you would just assimilate people, you would close the back door of your church. And I found out the hard way that's just not true. <laughs> uh, because if you don't engage them mm -hmm. and they're not heavily engaged in the ministry, once you connect them, not only will they leave, they'll leave more jaded and more angry than when they first came in. And just because you baptize them or connect them to a ministry doesn't mean you have them engaged in the ministry and you're discipling them you know, and so I think our minds have opened a lot. I'm really, my mind is shifting now to reopening the church. And I think now when we reopen, you know, I think our minds are going to be more open to seven day engagement mm -hmm. with the people who are somehow connected to our church already at a level seven days a week, you know, from Facebook groups like this that we're broadcasting in, you know, today. So we're going to have greater engagement, greater leadership retention, you know, more conversations with those that we've participated in their conversions, you know, all of that. I pray that our minds have opened and dialogue open. So we keep more people more engaged seven days a week when this pandemic is over. I love the fact that you just use the word engagement and conversation in the same paragraph. Because oftentimes that that conversation piece gets lost where um, we're pushing out social media and we're thinking, OK, the likes that we're getting back to little hearts in Facebook, that's the engagement. People are engaging with us and that is engagement, but that's the start. It's, it's not the end yep. when somebody likes that post. They are inviting you into a conversation for you to reengage with them. Every like, every comment, every share is an opportunity for us as the church to capitalize it, to have a conversation with the person. And so that, that in, gives you an opportunity, gives us an opportunity as the church to maybe look at social media, to look at some of these beginnings of conversations we're happening in a new way. How is what's going on in their life? How is COVID affecting their relationships, their home, their, their workplace? It's, it's funny, I had, I had a pastor tell me once that, you know, in, in 2000, this was actually 2019 last year. It's even more true today. If we really want to be effective, we need to stop making uh, statements and start making more questions, asking conversations, asking questions that begin conversations that allow for people to engage with us so that we have the opportunity as pastors to engage back. You know, I would jump in just to say, uh, Drake, when you mentioned interaction and listening to, uh, to Jeff share and uh, all this is that um, we, I, I'm sure a lot of you have done this, but we've decided to take our database, which I can't even tell you how many tens of thousands, you know, it's just a huge database. There's probably dead people in that database, you know, because we don't get a memo, right? <laughs> and so you, the, we've divided hundreds and hundreds of calls per, per person. 
and reached out and just asked people, we don't even know who so many of them are, how are you doing? How has this affected you? How can we pray for you? Is there anything mm -hmm. you need? And we've had people who visited our, our church one time back in X, fill in the blank. Now they are regular online because, and, and I get this story in the chat all the time, is that nobody's, nobody in their life has called them to see how they're doing. Mm. And we were the only ones. And as a result, then they're saying, and we just, now we're coming, logging in every week and we've gone into the archived messages and we're binge watching the series like Netflix. And that's been a common story as far as creating interaction is just this whole thing has created quite the ability to pastor and just to, to, to get on the phone and get on something digital and start, you know, interacting with people. It's produced a lot of engagement, a lot of connection. Ryan. Oh, go ahead. Um, don't cut you off, Myron. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you got it, Myron. Whatever you can say. Um, we've been experimenting. Love what Drake said about interaction on down engagement, but we've been experimenting with um, what I'm calling Digi Church Funnels. And it's a series of ads we're running. Uh, number one, we're running uh, what I'm calling testimony ads. It's an opportunity to get my story out there, stories from our churches out there. Uh, and as people interact with that, it moves them. We then move them to what we call a ministry ad. I got that from the dude from uh, Dutch Church. Um, and it's a simple, how can I pray for you ad? Mm -hmm. And on the back end, um, tons of people are subscribing. And then our next step for them is a plan your visit ad. And from there, we're trying to move people into our online community. And then from that community to a disciple making relationship. And it has set a precedence for um, engagement, conversation, and just digital ministry altogether. Yeah, the only thing that I would add in this, I think everybody's brought really great points. I like to start with when somebody's having a digital service, the mindset behind what they're creating and looking at the, the service on the weekend as, are we creating content that's just driving people to be spectators? Or are we creating a community opportunity on the weekend that, that creates people who are engaged? So one way we're com coaching CMU churches to do that is kind of giving them this idea of a 500 comment challenge. Meaning even mm. if you're a church of 50, by the time your service is over, what would it take to have 500 comments on your service? And how would you have to set up your service? And one of the ways we're saying is coaching is like, hey, don't go five minutes in your service without some sort of call for engagement. Have your leaders leading the way. And like, man, if we're asking a question, Man, immediately within the first 10 seconds, we've got 25 comments just on that question. And then every few minutes, there's another call to engagement. So, so when churches are looking at our digital services, one thing I would ask the pastor is, are we creating just more content where people are becoming just spectators? Or are we truly being the church where we're creating this community and like there's all sorts of back and forth and conversation? And I think if you if you start with your services being highly engaging, there's lots of great interaction. People feel like they're a part of it. They just can't pull out their phone and then set it down and just listen um, because we never want people to set the church down, you know? And so if you start from that perspective and your audience, when they, when they come to church, they're, they're already so engaged. Now getting them to take the next steps, I think become a whole lot easier because you're your weekend experience is more of a community. It's more of back and forth. It's more conversation. You're drawing people out of just kind of being spectators and being isolated to being a part of this thing that's going on. So that's one thing that we're seeing a lot of uh, CMU churches have a lot of great success with and kind of having fun with it and kind of that 500 comment challenge. And then it makes, it feels like it makes everything else so much easier um, because everybody in their, their audience starts out from that, Hey, I'm engaged in this. This isn't just something I, I watch. Ryan, yeah. I love I, I love that. And I, I was on a um, I was doing a podcast with a friend who's on the exec team of the largest Quaker church in the US. Mm -hmm. And he, he confessed to me he didn't go to his online church that weekend. He attended one in Clovis in the middle, you, you know, in the in the middle of rural California. It was a little two hundred person church. He was going to that service online. I said, Why are you doing that? He goes, Because they know me when I log on. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, if that's for an exec team member, 
how much for people out in the community that that yeah. we're reaching it's engagement not content that's going to win the day because we could yep. all attend saddleback church or north point next weekend the whole world could uh they could find google and find a sermon that fits exactly their needs for that week but but the truth is they're going to go where they feel known and they're going to go where where they feel engaged and so that's that that's just so so critical uh so important yeah, and I would say there's, I jump into a lot of digital services, just checking on our, our crew to see how they're doing. And there's one, like you said, kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And I, when I log in, it's so cool because I feel like now a couple weeks in, and I just jump in for a few minutes, I feel like I know the worship, you know, pastor, I feel like I know the lead pastor. And I feel like once we're able to meet back in person, if my family would go to that church, like I feel like I would know them mm -hmm. uh, and I did not know them at all before, before this. So again, I think as we're thinking through this idea of what does a relaunch look like when we're all able to gather together again, if your digital services have been that engaging where people are known and they get to know other people and it's not just like, you know, content on Netflix or Hulu or what, you know, it's like, man, I feel like I know these people. I can't wait to now, you know, give them a air fist bump, you know, from six feet away, that I think that's going to make a huge difference of getting people to actually go on this long journey with your church, a long discipleship journey, as opposed to, you know, this was a fun season and now I'm back to life as, as normal. So Jeff, are you going to jump into that? Yeah. Um, I, I'm actually thinking about like the church that's just starting out. I had a conversation with with the church this week where where the lady's like, I don't understand chat. Um, the only person mm. I'm talking to is myself, and it gets a little weird and tiring after a couple of weeks. And, and so, in and because they don't have that culture of engagement, the church as itself. And, and I asked her, I was like, How long have you been broadcasting? She's like, Four weeks. So the church doesn't even know how to well, operate in that environment. And if the church doesn't know, then the outsider doesn't know the visitor is not going to know how to behave because they've never been in this digital church in this church online mm -hmm. and so and this this sounds bad but it's something that that i recommend a lot especially to new churches set the behavior model have some ringers in the room some people maybe not the lead pastor is the one coming in having the conversation but some staff some high level volunteers not as chat hosts but as just normal people answering convert questions engaging and showing people how to behave in that scenario the church that i was at um uh, when when covid first hit the first week we had i don't know 12 15 chat hosts every staff person their wife and the dog somehow ended up being a chat host label in the in the room mm. and there's so much interactivity with the chat but when you actually looked at it there was nobody else talking it was just chat host to chat host staff person the staff person the staff person and it's like okay Maybe some of you people who are engaged in, in CHOP doing this, like take on a different persona, set the standard, model this. Maybe some of you guys move over to Facebook, do the same engagement over there, care about that. Like start to break it up and cover more responsibilities, but set the standard, model that behavior for what chat can look like. I, I, I wanna ask a question. Uh, go ahead, Byron. Go ahead, Drake. Right. No, I was going to say, I want to ask questions. So when you're talking about like, right now we're having a lot of conversation about as people are interacting, right? And so one of the things too, that what happens a lot of time to talk about, you know, Sean, you said it, assimilation versus engagement, you know, um, but there's also this, you know, beforehand, there's so much emphasis on this idea of this call to action, getting people to take next steps. And what I've noticed has been that much more difficult. And one of the conversations that we were having um, with a team that we've just recently developed and having to kind of wrestle with this as a church is um, where do we find that balance? Because first and foremost, when we're doing a call to action, it needs to be clear, it needs to be concise, and it needs to be compelling. Um, I think that it, it could be easy to come with clear and concise, make it short, make it clear, what's, what do you bring them to? But the question of why should they take that next step, right? There is that component. But the other thing we were wrestling with is we're seeing like people, like, when you're interacting with them, you're seeing people who are like, you would never step foot in a church. Like you, you have zero concept of that. You have actually hostile to faith. And we were trying to wrestle with this idea of like, where's that threshold, that tension between giving a call to action, but not making everything feel like you just want my information. 
Now, is this a season where we actually scale a little bit back on call to action? Or where do we find that balance to be able to say we want that person to interact, take a call action, get in the discipleship relationship, but we also don't want to look like we're a used car sales lot. And there's that much more on this digital side than it is anywhere else. Jeff, you, you put your hand up. Yeah, so uh, we've we've got Stadia. We've got a church planner that's doing something that's phenomenal in this area. Um, the guy, it's a little different context, but here's the example. Here's the punchline. He doesn't even live in the state that he wants to plant the church, but he's mm. recruiting and developing people, his core team, even though he's not even the state, and he's meeting these people completely cold through Facebook. He's utilizing Facebook groups, engaging with people, in the Facebook groups, messaging them directly, casting vision to what he wants to do. And, and he's developing and recruiting and discipling his whole people through Facebook Messenger. Messenger is right, right on one of the hottest platforms if it's done on, a, on an individual basis. You can't do mass marketing, mass emails, mass communications doesn't work. But one-on-one, -on -one, 80 to 90% open rate of a Facebook Messenger right now today. He is seeing 30 to 40% people respond. These are not people that he's warm with, relational people. These are cold. 30 to 40% of people cold are responding and engaging in conversations. Mm -hmm. And it's just because the dude's like meeting people in groups, seeing people who are liking comments and, and, and engaging with it. It's so it's it's not some of the old methods of the phone phone number. You want to call people today? I mean, it's it's going further and further away. Even texting is getting greatly reduced because of this mass consumption of what's there. Facebook Messenger has been so protective of that platform um, that you're not allowed to do that stuff. It's it's impossible. And so utilizing the one on one relationships that people are really valuing, that's huge right now on Facebook. I agree with you, Jeff. I, and I've been telling pastors for years, like on your, even on, you know, when we, when we worshiped in person, do you guys remember that? You know, uh, <laughs> connection cards were always like, it bothered me when my only options were, yes, I want to get saved. Yes, I want to get baptized. Yes, I want to serve, which scares them to death. They're afraid you're going to stick them in the purgatory of nursery till Jesus comes if they check that box. You know, yes, I want to get into a small group. You know, when 51% of the U.S. population on the Myers-Briggs test out as introverts, they're not interested in that, you know, but they would be open to a conversation about it. There's a much larger audience about that. So imagine when this is all over, Jeff, like, again, I think our minds have just been opened, everybody. I would be open to having a conversation on Facebook Messenger with somebody about the faith, my faith journey. I would be open to that. I'm not ready to say I want to get saved. No. Yeah. You know, but but I would be open to a conversation and here's my here's my Facebook profile. Boom. You know, and all of a sudden we focus on conversations before conversion to any decision, to any decision. I think what we focus on with our call to actions, Drake, is what I call the low hanging fruit. Yes, there is a percentage of people who walk in and say, yes, I'm ready to get saved. Yes, I'm ready to get baptized. Yes, I'm ready to serve. Yes, I'm ready to give. But a much larger segment of the audience. I have questions. I have apprehensions. I have fears. I have concerns. I have real doubts and, 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 and questions about this whole thing. And if we would focus on conversions, all of a sudden the fields that are really ripened to harvest in front of us, not just people who want to, you know, flip their eternal destinies, but opportunity for service and giving and 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 all of those things open up to the much broader audience. Does anybody else agree with that? I agree with that. Um, I think you know in education they call it de decoding. In other words, you break the steps down into finer steps than the ones that you're the categories that you're usually thinking, like the ones you were saying. I want to follow Jesus. I want to get in a small group. I want to serve. And uh, you know, I I used to teach piano. And uh, what I would say, and this is the truth, any of us and any of our listeners right now could play any song on the wor in the world on the piano if they play it slow enough. Mm -hmm. you, anybody, any, anybody could play a song perfectly on the piano if they play it slow enough. And by playing it slow enough means, okay, now depress this key, now press these two keys at the same time. I mean, if you take it that slow, 
they can do it. And so what I think uh, we need to do is not have, like you were saying, Sean, just links to a small, an online small group or links to a service opportunity. That's why we're creating a, on, online next steps, a place for discussion or a place to just any intermediate pockets of discussion that will break down the steps into the fact that they just need a little bit more time to talk and process about, they need an invitation to do something completely different that could lead to one of those big steps, but just uh, something where they can talk, get some questions answered, kind of meet some people, but stay a little anonymous in the conversation digitally if they want to. And, and these kinds of things uh, and ask to that rather than just to a deep dive in a baptistry or in a, in a service role. I think helps decode the process into steps that people will actually take. That concierge type service that you're describing, uh, I, I think is essential when doing church online because there's a relational component to that. I now have an opportunity to build a relationship with someone and walk them through the assimilation process. It was funny. I, I had, a, had a church. I'm not going to tell you the name of this church. I told them I wouldn't, but this stat is scary. They had 500,000 people documented through church online or through um, a TV. 500,000 people watch Easter service, literally half a million. Number of connection cards they received through all those services combined, 11. Mm -hmm. People don't necessarily want to give that level of information away. But if we can utilize something like Facebook or social media to engage where they are more safe to have those conversations where it's like, dude, you're now harassing me. I'm just going to block you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's safety for them in that level of conversation. Right now, I'm getting blown up on my text because somebody mistyped a phone number and gave them mine instead. And so some girl named Ashley applied for a job and gave my phone number. I'm getting 75 texts probably a week of people who want to hire Ashley. Even in this COVID season, Ashley still has plenty of opportunities to get a job. It's crazy. Because <laughs> and now I, it's my phone number now. Like, if I'm you stuck keep getting with her this, text. right? Right. And it's like I can block a phone number and somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. There's a lot of safety in utilizing that social media platform for that. And so like one of the things that we're experimenting with real quick, sorry, is a virtual lobby where after the service, all the platforms we're broadcasting into a Facebook group. And if people want to come hang out with us afterwards, if they want to interact, if they want to talk, we're using a service called StreamYard to do it. And what, what's happening is we're engaging with people via video in the room. They are engaging and responding. Ryan, your 500 challenge, that's awesome. We're doing something similar to that on, on Facebook because what we're now seeing is every one of those names, everybody who likes, who comments, is now getting a pastoral follow-up on. It's now an opportunity for us to ask questions, to offer a concierge service, to walk them through steps of faith, answer questions, and maybe see life change, maybe see life change as a result of it. I think what we're asking for has to change too. A lot of people, I think, just put a link to an online version of their previous connection card that they gave, which asked for a ton of info, their age ranges, everything else. And uh, people are, we're just asking for their email now. People are okay because they could add an email that they don't usually use a lot or they, you know, they just, uh, emails are okay. We're not asking for their cell phone up front because they're a little bit leery of, of giving you the digital footprint of their cell phone and for understandable reasons. And uh, so I think at knowing what, asking for a ton less, just the little piece that you want for now. And then as they move forward in different environments with you, you can, for obvious reasons and uh, needful reasons, ask for a little bit more information so that you can continue the relationship. And I think that that's an important thing uh, as well. What, what ways have you guys been seeing working well inside of the actual interactions? So you think Facebook or YouTube or the social media side, or you look at like Life Church's platform of like you can connect and you actually get prayer or they can fill out a connect card without actually leaving the feed. What, what principles inside of those areas are you seeing where interaction and asking questions can actually happen in the moment? Like, should that be where a lot of the, like, how, or how much emphasis in the moment of interaction while somebody's engaging content are we wanting to, to take away from them engaging and actually have a conversation? How much after the fact, like, where is that tension that you guys have seen? I actually look at the platforms as different purposes. Um, mm -hmm. typically what I see with, with, uh, the church online platform, for example, that's more of your warmer crowd. 
those are people that have because they have to intentionally go to your church website dot whatever dot chop mm -hmm. to get there and, and so these are people who are intentionally going after you even if they go to your website and follow the link they are intentionally going there and so it's a warmer crowd you're going to get more virtual prayer requests you're going to get um, people who are now ready to go join a small group. And so the, the interactions are more towards a warmer crowd. They're already part of your church or very much considering it, and then they're wanting to take that next step. Uh, Facebook, because of the shareability of video content, uh, same thing even with YouTube a little bit, definitely with Facebook, it's a colder crowd. Uh, they, they may be popping up on news free feed because you're a friend of a friend, um, something towards that where you – you have them for a very short amount of time. And so whatever you can do to capitalize on that, to get that like, to get that comment, to get that share, something that can give you a feed to follow up on, uh, to, to be able to reach out afterwards. Facebook, Facebook doesn't want you to watch a 50 minute video. They want you to watch it for 30 seconds and they're gonna do everything they can because their end game is to get you to watch as many videos as possible. And so you want to try with Facebook, I would suggest to capitalize on that as quickly as possible. So on the side of, uh, I, want to, I want to shift gears a little bit on in, in this engagement in, in two different ways. One is volunteers. Um, how are we engaging volunteers? A big question is coming in, you know, as, as everything was disrupting. But also, we look at this, all the conversation that we've had. How does this, is it, is it a similar philosophy? Are we still taking the same ideas of engagement inside of our different ministries, like kids, groups, impact ministry, youth ministry? Like um, from what you guys have seen, um, is, there, is there a different strategy in those things? Are we using the same principles? And also how are, we, how are we pulling in the people that may have been heavily involved in volunteering that are disrupted and other people to get involved because now you have a different, you know, a different mission, but the mission might even be more, wide stretch. So where do you see those two components? Do we use the same thing? Are there different things that we're doing? And how are we engaging people to get on mission still? So one thing that I'm seeing from churches that are really thriving during this season is one of the first things that they did is they got their volunteers involved, but in a new way. It's churches that were struggling, essentially like, hey, there's five to seven of us that just kind of put on church and everybody else becomes a spectator. Like this is an eight week sabbatical. And they're just, they're just not thriving like the churches that rounded the corner and be like, okay, this isn't time off. In fact, this is the, probably the greatest season that the church has ever had. We need volunteers more than ever before. Mm -hmm. We need you. The mission hasn't changed. The mission is still to help people find and follow Jesus. And we need you, your volunteer, your engagement um, more than ever before. And here's, it's going to look different, but here's what that's going to look like. And churches that rounded that corner, man, they're just, it's like adding fuel to a fire and they're just like going crazy. A couple ways that we're doing it at our church. Number one is before service, everybody, all the volunteer teams still get rostered for a service. So again, this isn't time off. This isn't sabbatical. Like you're still on. Uh, we have a pre-service huddle. So like this last weekend, I was rostered for the Sunday 10 a.m. Facebook service. 20 minutes before service started, we're in a Zoom huddle. So there was about 40 of us. And uh, the leadership of the church is cast in vision. Here's how you can be a part. Here's how now your, your role has changed, but here's how you're going to help us through the weekend reach spiritually lost people. And uh, gave us five points in terms of, hey, let's pray together. Let's huddle together. Let's share. Let's engage. And let's um, post personalization of the service. So gave us five simple ways that the volunteer could be involved. That huddle ended as service started. So service started on Facebook uh, Live. All 40 of us Im immediately went over. We shared the service. We made it personal. I created a, a post and said, hey, you're invited to, to join the Wakefield family uh, right now for, for Summit Park Church service type deal. So within the first 90 seconds, that service kicked off with 40, with 40 shares. And so you just see the numbers start to go like this. And then you've got your entire volunteer team for that service ready to go inviting friends, commenting, engaging, saying hello as people are jumping on, engaging back and forth with the content happening. And so like, I, we could keep going on and on. That's just one example. But churches that got volunteers involved 
fired up. And, and oh, by the way, those volunteers now are much more likely to be generously supporting uh, the, the mission of the church during the season because they're not spectators anymore. They're like, oh my word, the, the vision of the mission is still happening. It's still moving forward like, like never before. And so now your generosity uh, is not going like this. It's actually people are more fired up. Um, so yeah, I, I think that is a huge deal. So if, if your church hasn't yet got your volunteers rallied around the vision, what that's going to look like in this season, that's one huge way of not only um, seeing more people jump on your services and, and take those calls to action, but it's also a great way to, to solve that generosity component, which is kind of a, a huge deal right now as well. We have, uh, I wish we were where, uh, where, you, where you were at at that. We, we, we just saw, you know, at first here at California, we were seeing that this was going to be maybe a month to two months. So we didn't want to recreate the, uh, a, a wheel to that point. And now that we see that this is going to string out for us a long time, now we're, we're having to uh, identify what the online applications are for each volunteer team you know, if there is or, or regroup them, because I think what you're right, getting them engaged like that is, is key. But one of the things I'm focusing on from an assimilation point of view is how do we get new volunteers plugged in during this, this online time? And to tie in the last topic about live chat and how we're doing that is uh, uh, an interesting thing happened last week. What we've done in the live chat to help us do this well is before service starts, a good 15 minutes before, it's, it, it, it's talk it up. And we, we have questions like, where are you logging in from? And we find that they're from all over and people start talking to each other. Where, where's the best takeout food you had that delivered to your door this week? You know, stuff like that. And then once the service starts, the worship, the message, this stuff, it, it, it's, it's talk down, talk it down. Mm -hmm. Meaning that we're not gonna do that kind of relational stuff because it's gonna distract from the message, but we're gonna say a line from that worship song that's really impacting us. You know what I mean? And maybe share a link to that YouTube video or, or as a, a quote from the pastor's teaching, or all of a sudden we see people as in real time, which can't happen in physical church, they get convicted at a point in the message and they click the prayer thing. And then we're one-offing in prayer over, you know, doing direct prayer stuff. So it's, it's more focused towards the content. So we talk, talk it down a little bit there, but then when the service is over, it's talk it out. We stop sharing the links that we did in the pre-service and uh, that people are requesting during it. We just are embracing you know what I mean? And doing that kind of stuff. Well, it, as we've, we've, we've kind of divided the kinds of conversations so that it just really is flowing all the time. Finally, we started seeing people become moderators who weren't moderators. Like we just watched, like last week we saw three people and, and they, were, they were acting as if that they were us, not intentionally, but every, they, the, all of a sudden we backed off and the conversation was being operated by all those in it without the moderator's help. Yeah. And we noticed three people that were making that happen. And so we reached out to them and now they're going to become volunteer moderators. And we just went, oh, look at this. You know, we can begin to now identify some, some great roles that are going to be midterm and probably will exist in some form in the new normal that, um, that we can attach to our new digital next steps, whatever else. But all of a sudden, this kind of great engagement in live chat can also unearth vision for us, you know, as we look at it for how we can engage people in meaningful service by watching the same, we would watch them react with people in physical church in the halls and go, hey, that's a great person for that. Well, we can watch that uh, on the internet. We can watch it in live chat. We can watch it digitally and see that there are people who are perfectly poised and able in this environment to really serve Jesus in some awesome ways. I, I agree with you, Greg. I think, I think we've done a disservice to people in kind of sequencing the spiritual journey process. Like we tend to think they, they have to get saved, then they have to get baptized, you know, then they join a group, then they start serving, then God forbid they start giving, you know, in reality <laughs> now yeah. in the digital engagement world, like what would happen? If, if you look back at the gospels, like some people started following Jesus because he was on a mission mm -hmm. and they wanted to be part of something. Mm -hmm. and others because they were interested in living water and had broken relationships, you know, and they wanted community. And so I think there's opportunities, you know, not just to make a, a sequenced call, you know, but there are opportunity that for people to want to go on mission trips 
that aren't yet saved? Are we, are we, are we oh, yeah. open to even going there? You know, and appeal and talking to people about wanting to, to make a difference in the world, you know, while they're watching an online sermon and letting them take a step to show interest in having a conversation about going on a trip around the world with some like, you know, some people who want to make a difference. I think there's so many opportunities in that space as well to, to engage people. And I think we'd be shocked at how many people would be interested in serving what I call a shallow end of the pool uh, area in the church, not where they're going to share their faith, not where you need to platform their behaviors, you know, people that aren't completely cleaned up and are a little rough around the edges, but allowing them to have conversations about serving you know, before they're converted and cleaned up and behaving right and believing right. I just think there's a lot of opportunity there in the coming days in the church. I think we should have 20% of our volunteer positions that are for people, that people who are Buddhist and atheist and everything. And so we have that at our church. We have green light, which is go. We have yellow, which is the implied representation of God in the church. We want you to be a Christ follower and, and that kind of thing. And then red level, which is stop and get to know you because you're going to be a ministry team leader or a small group leader. And we're, we're contemplating online asking some questions of people of how they might want to serve that the questions kind of help them self-identify in one of those three groups, and they would not know that, and explore then online with somebody who understands positions that we have in the online world that would be perfect for wherever they're at in their spiritual journey and do that. Because I, I think what you're saying, Sean, is, is absolutely incredible. Myron, I think I cut you off by accident. Yeah, go for it, Myron. Uh, no problem. Um, one statement that... Uh, we're, we're wrapping our arms around is do we want um, a vision for family members or a time slot for volunteers? Um, I think volunteers are short lived, but family members are forever. Mm. And so we've, I've X'd out the word volunteer in our church. Um, because for me, volunteer means there like there's no relational equity there's there's a there's a a job description that i want you to have and to perform and i we're having a lot more retention around that warm relational language that hey we're a family and as a family we have responsibilities mm. then we're also learning to not truncate um the giftedness of our family members by reducing them to a time slot on Sunday, but by mobilizing them as hope builders into their very communities via digital, text, uh, Facebook. And we're just having so much success with that language. I think as we change the language of our audience, people will be a, a lot more inviting to wanting to serve uh, because we, we're not trying to get anything out of them, actually trying to get something for them. So that's kind of the thing that we're, we're wrestling with, learning, learning from. And... So there's a word. I love yeah. that. And actually, I want, I want to ask a follow-up question, which is weird because I shouldn't ask a question. I'm a panelist. Uh, Myron, um, okay, trust but verify. You want to welcome people into the family. You don't know the people. I'm curious, and, and I want you to say for everybody else, what's the process how do you take a person who you don't know, who's outside the family, how do you bring them into the family? What, what does it look like? And what are some situations where maybe, you know, you want them into the family, but you don't necessarily want them hanging around the, you know, uh, bad analogy kids or something like that. Like, how do you, how do you manage that bringing it into the family? Yeah, I think the same way Jesus did. He had a, a thief on his, in his family and he knew it. Um, have you ever, I've been to a family reunion before and they were all family. We just didn't know them. Uh, I had the, 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 the blessing of meeting my dad's brother who uh, didn't know that he was uh, my uncle after my dad had passed away. And um, we met at a funeral. We met at an event um, mm -hmm. and that event facilitated a discussion that led to more interaction. And I think it's the same way on digital platforms. They are events that should foster discussion that lead to more interaction. And so for example, when one of our family members opens up to host our digital worship service, uh, he says, he's, he's our church plant resident. He says, good morning, family. 
And the reason why we say that is because we want to be inclusive. We don't want to create an us versus them. And so it's, it's so we, we've adopted language. And so we, we don't even say first time guests, you know, first time guests are for, um, you know, hotel people who visit a hotel for the first time. <laughs> like, um, but, but no, like your, your family, like the reality is this, we're all created in the image of God and we all come from Adam and, and I'm not a universalist. That's not what I'm saying. But I think if we can start with the fact that we are literally all family, we come from one man, one woman, Adam and Eve. And then how can we build on that to take people to a place of adoption, uh, to sonship, uh, through Jesus. And so that's our paradigm. Um, we obviously, you know, you, you don't want a family member who raped somebody around a kid, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Um, and so you put boundaries on family members until they can learn to control themselves. Yeah. So I want to shift gears into one last thing as we land this plane and respect everybody's time as we shift. I know, um, uh, Greg Curtis had mentioned, you know, we're going to be in this a lot longer than maybe we think and we need to position ourselves. But as we move, the terms we've been using in our church is we had the blizzard, we're moving into winter, but there's going to be a mini ice age that, you know, that there is no, it's a new normal. It's a different, whatever, whatever it's going to look like that we're not going back to a bit for. So when we think about the reality we are living right now, what are the things that churches need to be thinking about as they position out of this so that the momentum they're getting in this digital, the, the benefits they're getting in this digital can transfer into what new normal will look like that's gathering in person, a combination. What, what are the things that maybe churches need to be thinking about now so they can be processing for longevity 10, 20, 30 years from now? I think the future is kind to the prepared. And I think mm. we need to visualize two to three scenarios that might be likely and prepare for all three because we don't know. And anybody who says they do know what the new normal is, I wouldn't believe yet. Okay. Uh, and I think so much depends on how this quarantine ends. You know, is it going to be a super gradual rollout or is it going to be like we're free and everybody just, you know, that's going to change how things happen a little bit um, as it goes. If you had a gun to my head, I'd say one of one of the definite options that could be would be that um, we'll see that if it's a semi abrupt thing for large gatherings that all of a sudden we'll probably have record attendance at, at church for for the first weekend. Just unbelievable because everybody's free. Maybe the next week, a uh, little less, but good. But by the end of the month, I think it may land less than what your average attendance was before but your attendance will still be very much greater because people will be staying with online because for months they developed more of a habit of going to church in small group regularly than they did when there was just physical options. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the decisions that people need to look at to be ready for is just declaring that your online church in the future is going to be a campus just like your campus in whatever city. This is our online campus. And, um, and that people, because here's the dirty truth we don't want to admit. You can have more community online than you can if you come physically to our church. And that's people aren't understanding that. You know, what church can you sit in a sermon and when you're convicted, press a button and have somebody pray for you one-on-one? -on -one? Yeah. You know, what, wh wh you could go on and on and on. You can walk in and out of a church and never speak to a soul, but, you, you know, rarely do you get, you can get personalized attention online during the service at every moment of it. And you can be interacting and engaging with people. So the idea that there's real community physically it is, uh, and not online is a misnomer. That's like saying we're not really having conversations if it's on the telephone. You know, it, we, we, we need to understand that in the future, this online thing is going to have a, an ongoing piece, and it's not going to just be the front porch anymore. And so uh, staffing around that and um, including that in your strategy and accepting the fact that people are going to move in and out of that too a certain percentage is going to be part of preparing for the new normal in my view. I love that. It's not going to be the front porch anymore. Greg, I'm going to steal that. I'll, I'll give you credit, but that that's going in the repertoire. <laughs> that was, that was beautiful. Um, here's the reality. We've done physical church uh, in this country, in America. Sorry, uh, Canadian Drake. Uh, I have no idea how long it's been up there for you, but we've been doing it a couple hundred, two, 300 years at this point. We're pretty good at doing the physical church, or at least we think we are. 
Um, yeah, the church is as a general rule. Some of you guys planned ahead. Awesome. Good for you. But as a general rule, we've been doing digital church, church online for six weeks. Um, we're, we're not good at it. And, and, and truth be told, we need to get better at it. Some of the language that, that I use a lot is fidgetal. It's a merging of physical and digital. Um, the stuff that Myron's talking about with dig digit church, the stuff that I'm doing with digital only expressions of church, that's awesome. That's still cutting edge in some areas because there is going a lot of churches are digital only, but they are going to segue back to a physical model. We need to figure mm -hmm. out how to blend the two together and do it right. I want to go back to something Greg said early, like way back, because Greg's like, you know, the benefit of the chat room is you get to like engage with people that way. And then when the message happens, like you can compliment and reinforce what the teacher's doing. But like this is the great thing about church online because you can do that. And in my mind, I'm, I've always wondered, why don't we do chat rooms in the physical building? Why don't we engage with the cell phones and still engage with it virtually and use it as a second screen to reinforce things? And so I think there's an option maybe to even merge technology. By the way, if you steal that idea, go for it. That's awesome. Give me 5%. But I think there's an option to like merge some of this physical and digital together in ways that we haven't even realized before this. But now as a result of COVID, like we're going to have to, like the ideas are just going to come. Yeah, Jeff, I, this is my last comment and I've got to jump off, but um, to use your analogy, Drake, the ice age, like the people who didn't survive out of the ice age were the ones who barricaded themselves in a cave and hoped mm. it was going to get better. Mm. You know, th there, there are opportunities even in an ice age. That's the only thing I like about that metaphor. And maybe we go back to being hunters and gatherers of opportunities and this is not for the week. This is going to kill off the churches that are sitting around and waiting for things to return to normal. They're, it's going to kill them. It's going to kill them. Barricaded in the cave, hoping things are going to return to normal. It's, they're, they're going to die. The churches that are going to thrive and come out of this thing with more impact, more influence, more engagement are the ones that don't take a victim mentality and take responsibility for what they can do and yep. what they do have, not what they don't have. And they go gather and they hunt and they search and they grind, you know, to, 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 to the opportunities that are in front of them. And I, I think we're going to enter into the best age of the church in history. That's mm -hmm. my vote. I love it. I'm going to, we're going to wrap this up. Uh, Greg Atkinson, you brought all of these guys together. I want to give you the last word of encouragement to the church. And why don't you pray for the church as well? So any parting words and, uh, and bless the church. And then we're going to, we're going to send people off as the scattered saints. Yeah. I just want to thank everybody for participating as, as Greg Curtis said, uh, nobody's an expert in this new paradigm. You know, we, we came up with this title beyond Sunday engagement in the new paradigm for this webinar, but uh, none of us have been through a global pandemic before. This is, this is, this is new uh, territory. So there are no experts. There are people who have been doing this for a long time. You know, Jeff and I two years ago were at Disneyland talking about online church. I blogged about online church in 2009, uh, 11 years ago. And Myron's been, blazing a trail, but none of us have been in a place where we couldn't gather physically. This is new ground. This is, this is a different world. And so there are a lot of things to consider. Uh, I like the ice age um, analogy that Sean said. And, and um, uh, I think uh, there's so many great points that get brought up. I, I did a, uh, a blog post. Uh, if you just go to my name, gregatkinson.com. I did uh, two blog posts ago, uh, uh, ideas of how church websites should, should be looking. And I and linked to Myron's church and to Greg Curtis's church and others about what their home page and uh, Drake's church, what their home page should look like and how it should have changed uh, right now. Cause people don't need to see directions to your campus. They need to see your online campus. And so uh, how that changed. And then also uh, I just had a brand new, um, uh, blog post that dropped today about 10 questions you should ask your congregation before you reopen. I'm like Sean. Sean said that we're, uh, we're now thinking about reopening, re relaunching, getting back into meeting. But as, as it's, as has been said, if the, and Greg Curtis said, it's going to happen 
in various stages. Some people may, may not be able to gather more than 50 people. Some may be not more than 100. Some people, it's going to be open the doors up. Sometimes you may open the doors up and the people still don't come because they're scared and they don't want to get sick. And so uh, I, I just brought back the idea of the old congregational survey and said, here's 10 questions you need to ask your congregation. And uh, just uh, if you check out that blog post, it's a resource that it'll be a downloadable PDF resource for you to use to, 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 to poll your congregation to say, hey, if we gather, are you even going to come? If you volunteer, are you still going to volunteer? If you have kids, are you going to put them in children's ministry? Like, what does this look like as we move forward? But I echo everything that's been said here. And I hope that this is not uh, a short, brief, like uh, Greg said earlier, um, sabbatical from physical church. And we have leaned heavily on online church. And then when things open back up, we shelf the online church and just go back to physical. I hope that there's always an online campus. Uh, that's my prayer is that it's the both and. And so uh, I just want to thank these guys. They're all experts in, in my mind. They're coaches, consultants, pastors, practitioners, and I encourage you to check out them and their resources and all that yep. they offer uh, for your church. So thank you guys for sharing with uh, everybody today. Awesome.